Whoosh! Your spaceship is almost there! Thanks to the latest technologies, you can now travel to any planet in our solar system faster than ever before. And we can finally visit other planets completely safely. You applied for a space tour, and now you're on a ship with your guide, astronauts, and a couple of other passengers. First stop? The smallest planet in our solar system, Mercury. It's only a third of Earth's distance to the Sun. The view is going to be spectacular. As soon as your ship lands on the solid surface of this rocky planet, you see an endless universe. Stars, passing comets, and the Sun. Three times bigger than we see it from Earth, with no clouds to interfere with the view. There are no moons. Mercury and Venus don't have any. You try to move, but because of your spacesuit and reduced gravity, it feels like you're on a trampoline in a slow-motion movie. It's not safe to come here during the day. On Mercury, it lasts almost 59 Earth days. Although your spacesuit keeps you safe, temperatures can get pretty extreme. During the day, they go up to 800 degrees Fahrenheit. There's no atmosphere to keep the heat, so temperature during the night can drop down to minus 290 degrees. That's why Mercury isn't the hottest planet, even though it's closest to the Sun. Venus is the second closest, but it has an atmosphere that retains the heat. You're safe in your special spacesuit, but it will still be really hard to go through such drastic temperature changes, so you need to hurry. Mercury has weaker gravity because it weighs less than Earth, which means the gravity on Mercury pulls less on your body. If a person weighs 100 pounds on Earth, they'd weigh 38 pounds on Mercury. And you do feel lighter. Hurry up, we don't have much time! You hear your guide's voice in your spacesuit. He's standing next to you, pointing his finger. Look to your left! That's why we're here! Caloris Basin. Amazing! Mercury has such a thin atmosphere, there's nothing to protect the planet from asteroids slamming into its surface. It has the most craters in our solar system, which is why it reminds you of the moon. And now you're there, looking at the Caloris Basin, the biggest impact crater in the entire solar system, formed almost 4 billion years ago by an object at least 60 miles long. You can see its rocky interior, filled with deep fractures and high, sharp ridges, surrounded by the highest mountains you can find on this planet, towering 2 miles above numerous lava vents. They used to be active. The other side that's hidden from the sun has tiny deposits of ice, which is the only form of water here. But you don't have time to see it. Mercury is only a temporary stop before you keep moving. As soon as you get comfortable on the ship, you see your guide approaching you. Eh, we can't stop on Venus, he says. Sometimes we can at least get closer to the surface, if not land and go out. But today, <laughs> the winds are crazy. They're usually a little over 220 miles per hour, and they keep the yellow or bright white clouds of the planet in constant motion. Volcanic activity formed the surface of Venus. 90% of it is solidified basalt lava, so it might not be the best place to visit anyway. Also, it has a dense atmosphere. While inside the spaceship, you get a video call on the special space communication system from your friend. She took some time off a little bit earlier than you did and went to Jupiter. Now Jupiter is a gas giant, so there's nowhere you can land. Also, the pressure is really strong. It squishes gas into a liquid. So Jupiter's atmosphere could crush any metal spaceship that goes through the colorful clouds like it's made of paper. Visitors mostly take day trips to see it, cruising in their spaceships, taking pictures from above. It's crazy because that planet is like a stormy whirlpool of wind, and it has the brightest auroras in the entire solar system. Your friend even saw the Great Red Spot. It's a giant oval-shaped storm moving in a counterclockwise direction. It was amazing! The red spot is four times bigger than Earth. But the real treat was Europa, Jupiter's sixth moon. Scientists believe it's young because of its smooth and relatively untouched surface. Europa is a big oceanic world with all the right ingredients for life we haven't discovered yet. They even offer you tours where you try to discover if there's anything waiting under a thick ice shelf. Visitors have to wear some special, extra-protective spacesuits because Europa receives huge amounts of radiation from Jupiter. And there's Io, another one of Jupiter's moons, which is colorful and just the most beautiful thing ever. It's the place with more volcanic activity than Earth and has the most active volcanoes in our solar system. Over 400 volcanoes! 150 of them can erupt any time. Jupiter's gravity pushes the volcano's activity. It squeezes Io like a rubber ball, and that results in volcanoes. You wish you could have been there with her, but right now you're going towards your next location. 
days pass by, and at one moment, you see Earth from a distance. You feel a little bit nostalgic, thinking about your friends and family. But after a while, you get excited as you see your next destination. Finally, it's the Red Planet. You hear the distant and muffled sound of the spaceship landing on the rusty surface. Everything around you is just a barren, giant desert. The wind is strong, kicking up dust. That's how those huge alien sand dunes are made. And the storm will come these days, they say. Billions of years ago, Mars had liquid water on its surface, lakes and rivers, maybe even life around or inside them. Its axis of rotation is a bit tilted, so Mars has seasons similar to those on our planet. Imagine a world where the laws of physics, the environment, and the conditions are vastly different from what we're used to. How would we adapt and evolve to survive in these strange new lands? Let's see. Mercury is the closest planet to the Sun and has a thin atmosphere. The temperatures there are extreme, with the day side reaching over 800 degrees Fahrenheit and the night side dropping to negative 290 degrees Fahrenheit. So, what can we do to survive these crazy temperatures and constant solar radiation? Maybe we can magically turn into metal. For example, titanium and platinum can perfectly tolerate high temperatures. But seriously though, there is an option. We could settle underground, where the temperatures aren't so frenzied. If we lived underground, we might evolve with large eyes to better capture light. We might also evolve thicker skin to protect ourselves from the intense radiation. Basically, we have two options. Become metal or become moles. Let's move on to Venus. This planet is extremely hostile. First of all, Venus is known for its thick, more toxic than your ex type of atmosphere. The whole planet is covered with carbon dioxide and its surface is absolutely dry, making it incredibly hot. The average temperature is around 847 degrees Fahrenheit, making it one of the hottest planets in our solar system. Also, don't forget about the crazy pressure. Standing on Venus would be like standing 3,000 feet underwater. Only particular hardy microbes from Earth could survive in such conditions. So, if you want to live on Venus, you might have to become a microbe. But, unfortunately, since we're not microbes, we have to wear special gear and equipment to survive there. Maybe we'd have to develop a heat-resistant exoskeleton to protect ourselves, as well as get some new lungs that can filter out the toxic elements in the atmosphere. Let's talk about our favorite red sibling, Mars. The first noticeable change after a few hundred years would be your new skeleton. The gravity on Mars is much weaker than on Earth, so your muscles and bones would shrink. To make up for this difference, you'd have to eat more and probably start going to the gym. Also, you'd have to adapt to the low atmospheric pressure and colder temperatures. You need to retain heat, right? That means you'd need a thicker layer of body fat. Sorry folks, but on Mars, we might become fatter. Another reason to start working out. Another big change would occur in your skin. Your skin is like a big barrier that protects you from harmful things such as bacteria, UV light, looking totally creepy, and so on. So what would happen to it? Most likely, you would turn orange, due to the carotenoids. Carotenoids are a type of nutrient that you get from foods such as carrots, potatoes, tomatoes, and so on. They protect very well against ultraviolet radiation on Mars. They only have one downside. By eating a lot of pumpkins from the Martian farmer's market, you'll gradually start to turn orange. But maybe it's not so bad. Maybe life on Jupiter would be easier. Yeah, no, it has no solid land. This planet is made up of hydrogen and helium and is referred to as a gas giant. You would simply float there, like in a huge cloud. And even if you managed to land and try to walk, it would be like moving through a super thick fog. So how would we evolve there? Firstly, we might become much larger in size to withstand the immense pressures. Secondly, the temperature fluctuations on Jupiter are enormous. The surface is terrifyingly cold and the temperature rises significantly under the outer layers of the atmosphere. Thirdly, if you lived on Jupiter, there would be no verbal language. This gas giant absorbs radio waves, so even if you were speaking, no one would hear you. There would be no music either, so no parties. And what's the point then? Hey, maybe we could communicate with sign language, but that's not so simple either. 
Jupiter is full of wild winds and storm clouds, so it's unlikely you would be able to see anything. So even if we evolved there in some way, our lives would still not be easy. Before landing on Saturn, you would probably want to check out its iconic rings. But you wouldn't be able to do that because Saturn's rings consist of a bunch of ice particles flying in space, so it would be extremely hard to land. So, let's go straight to Saturn itself. At first, it may seem that Saturn is not bad for us. Some layers of this gas giant have quite pleasant temperatures. If we dive deeper into Saturn, it gets surprisingly warm. Up to 26 degrees Fahrenheit in its second layer. This is an average temperature in countries like Sweden and Canada. But, unfortunately, this is only one such layer. The rest of the planet is incredibly cold, so in order to survive on Saturn, we'd have to do a lot of work. In addition to the cold, we'd have to deal with the planet's harsh environment, including its intense storms, strong winds, and radiation. To protect ourselves from these conditions, we'd need to evolve tough skin again, find some insulation, and so on. Next planet is Uranus. Uranus has a very different environment from Earth, with much colder temperatures, a lack of a solid surface, and a much different atmosphere. It's like another Jupiter, but with blue vibes. It's not that bad, though. There's even water on Uranus. The only problem is, the planet is full of ammonia, that nasty stuff we use for cleaning. So don't be surprised if you feel the gross smell. Also, it's incredibly cold out there, almost like a never-ending winter. So what would it be like to survive in such a dark and harsh environment? We'd need thicker skin again to cope with extreme temperatures. I hope you feel well rested because I've got a tough task for you. Don't worry, it's fun. You're going to visit different planets of our solar system and try to run on each of them. Let's figure out where you can run the fastest and where you can barely walk. The fastest man on Earth, Usain Bolt, can run with an average speed of about 23 miles per hour. But his top speed is higher, up to 27 miles per hour. Sadly, we can't all be Usain Bolts. The average person runs at a speed of 6 to 8 miles per hour. But maybe there's a planet out there where you can beat the famous Jamaican sprinter's records. But first things first, what will affect your speed when you run on other planets? For one thing, gravity. Depending on how strong it is on the planet you visit, it'll influence your weight. And in most cases, the heavier you are, the more slowly you run. Plus, on all other planets in our solar system except Earth, you'll have to wear a bulky spacesuit. Without it, your chances of survival there are non-existent. And don't forget about extreme weather conditions on most planets. It's either freezing cold or boiling hot, or very, and I mean it, windy. Anyway, your amazing journey is about to begin. Buckle your seatbelt. The first planet on your itinerary is Mercury. As you sneak a peek at this world through the window of your spaceship, you notice that the planet looks eerily similar to the good old moon. But just a few moments later, you realize it's just an illusion. All over the surface of Mercury, you see craters left by space rocks. Hmm, this may make your task of running on this planet way harder. This and your bulky spacesuit. Duh. But you wouldn't survive on Mercury without this protection. The temperatures on the planet are extreme. 800 degrees Fahrenheit during the day and negative 290 degrees Fahrenheit at night. Hey. But there's one thing that can work in your favor on this unfriendly planet. Let's say you weigh 155 pounds on Earth. Then on Mercury, you'd weigh around 58 pounds. Which means that despite your bulky spacesuit, you can move way faster than you do on Earth. And maybe your speed will even reach 13 miles per hour if you try really hard. The next planet on your itinerary is Venus, also called the Morning Star. While coming closer, you see a world very different from the bluish planet you might have seen in books. Before landing, you have to get through a super dense atmosphere made up of carbon dioxide. And while your spacecraft is descending, you're watching thick clouds of sulfuric acid pass by. Venus is often called Earth's twin because these two planets are of similar size and density. No wonder that on Venus, you weigh almost as much as you do on Earth, 140 pounds. So your weight is a bit smaller here, but don't forget about your spacesuit. And still, because of almost the same conditions on the two planets, you'd be able to run a bit faster than on Earth, 
at around 8.5 miles per hour. Your first impression of Mars is that it's freezing cold. The average temperature here is about negative 80 degrees Fahrenheit. Even from afar, the planet looks reddish. Once you make your first step on the Martian surface, you understand why. The ground's covered with rusty colored dust. The same fine dust is floating in the air around you. Wherever you look, you see golden, brown, tan, and even greenish hues. They depend on the minerals that make up the soil. The size of the dust layer varies from area to area, but in most places, it's around seven feet thick. Hmm, that can make running much more difficult. On Mars, your weight would be much smaller than on Earth, a mere 58 pounds. This will help you achieve an impressive speed of 12 miles per hour. <laughs> Aren't you a champ? What's that on the horizon? It looks like a tornado. Is it a dust storm? Then it's time to make a run for it. Dust storms sometimes cover the entire planet, and you can even see the largest ones from Earth. And now you are facing a problem. You see, Jupiter, as well as Saturn, is a gas giant. This means that the largest planet in the solar system, and Jupiter is so large it could swallow 1,300 Earths, doesn't have any solid surface. Well, you'll just have to imagine what your running workout would look like if you could run on Jupiter. This planet has an atmosphere that consists of hydrogen and helium gas. During your descent, you admire thick brown, yellow, red, and white clouds. They make the planet look colorful and beautifully striped. On Jupiter, you'd weigh 390 pounds. You'd have to break a sweat to simply walk there wearing your clumsy spacesuit. If you could step on the planet's surface, that is. If you tried to run there, your best result would probably be a speed of one or two miles per hour. To make matters worse, it's extremely windy on Jupiter, with the wind speeds ranging from 200 to 400 miles per hour. Do you see those rings? That's Saturn, another gas giant with no solid surface. This planet's made up of mostly hydrogen and helium, and its temperature and density change the deeper you go. If you decided to leave your spacecraft and step on Saturn's surface, you'd just fall into the planet. But from above, it looks as if Saturn does have a surface. The seemingly solid yellowish-brown sphere is surrounded by several layers of clouds. The visible outer layer is made up of ammonia clouds. Under them, there are hydrosulfide clouds. And the innermost layer is made up of clouds of water. Even though Saturn is a gas giant, your weight wouldn't be very different here, around 165 pounds. That's because the planet's gravity is similar to that of Earth. You travel faster than the speed of light in interstellar space. How cool! The light from thousands of stars rushes past you. A few minutes and you're on the other side of the Milky Way and going to work. Such travel has long been common for humans, for you are a member of the human civilization that has conquered the entire galaxy. But it took almost 90 million years to get there. So how did we achieve this? It's like a computer game. In the beginning, we had a fleet of three motherships that could travel at 310 miles per second. Each of them had 10 colonization pads. The ship could undock a pad and drop it on the desired planet. We also had two speed ships that traveled twice as fast, but could only colonize one planet. Each colonized planet could send one new ship on an expedition. So humanity was able to spread across the galaxy in 90 million years. Most of that time was spent flying from star to star. So the main problem of colonization is speed. Year 2021. Our spaceships can now fly at about 24,850 miles per hour. That's enough speed to travel from New York to Los Angeles in less than four minutes. But a trip to neighboring planets like Mars still takes about seven months. The nearest star to the Sun, Proxima Centauri, is 4.2 light years away. That means light, the fastest thing in the universe, takes 4.2 years to get there from the Sun. It would take our rocket 73,000 years to get there. That's longer than an advanced human civilization has existed. And our galaxy, the Milky Way, is 105,000 light years wide. So even traveling at the speed of light would take forever. So naturally, humanity came up with other ways to travel. Let's move into the future and imagine that we've solved this problem. We started accelerating with microscopic probes propelled by a directional laser beam from Earth. This made it possible to reach speeds of 25% of the speed of light, still very slow. 
The problem was that nothing that has mass can travel at the speed of light. So we moved on to the Alcubierre drive study. This method doesn't involve moving from point A to point B, but instead compressing the space between those points. Here's a piece of checkered paper. Imagine that you need to travel three squares to your destination. Instead of moving in a straight line as fast as possible, we squeeze these squares so that our spaceship is at point B. Now we unsqueeze them back. Space is normalized and we've traveled, in fact, standing still. This is how the Alcubierre drive works. It compresses space in front of the spaceship and expands it behind its tail. So, theoretically, an Alcubierre drive spaceship can move at any speed, even faster than the speed of light. But the amount of energy needed to do this is enormous, and it could be compared to the mass energy of the entire planet of Jupiter. So, while some scientists were working to improve the Alcubierre drive, others were looking inside the most mysterious object in the universe, a black hole. A black hole is something so heavy that it attracts even light and won't let it go. Imagine a circular trampoline. This is our space-time. We put a basketball in its center. The trampoline sags a little bit. Now all the objects we put on the trampoline will roll toward the basketball. That's how gravity works. But if you roll the golf ball past the basketball, it has a chance of getting out of this funnel. Now put a heavy bowling ball in the center of the trampoline. The trampoline sags even more. Now the golf ball will inevitably fall into the funnel with the bowling ball with no chance of escape. That's how a black hole works. And some scientists believe there may be a wormhole at the heart of a black hole. It's a shortcut between point A and point B in the universe. Back to our piece of paper. Instead of moving straight ahead, we fold the piece so that point A is right above point B. Now we make a hole in the paper and move to point B. We unfold it back and voila, you've arrived at your destination. So there's a theory that if a spaceship enters the black hole's gravitational field and withstands the incredible stress there, it can exit to any other point in the universe which that wormhole led to. It might even be another galaxy, or even a parallel universe. Well, our research was successful, and now, looking at a map of the Milky Way, we can get to absolutely anywhere. All that remains is to choose the right place to colonize. There are about a billion stars. Around each of them are planets possibly suitable for life. So we need to narrow down the list. First, we look for relatively young stars, almost like our sun. Near them, a human colony can potentially live for a long time. After that, when a star gets old, it begins to expand and turn red. In the last stages of its life, it can absorb all the planets around it and then explode with such force that the light from the explosion can be seen dozens of light years away. Secondly, the candidate for a human colony must be in the habitable zone of the star. It's a sweet spot, not too far away from and not too close to the star, so that it's not too cold or too hot there. In other words, water on the planet must exist in liquid form. Also, the candidate planet must have a solid surface so that we can live on it. Another important factor is the size of the planet. If it's too big, its gravitational force will press on us. It'll be harder for us to jump, walk, and lift weights on this planet because we're used to the Earth's gravity. But if the planet is too small, we'll feel like real strong men there. We'll be able to jump high and lift large weights. But then our muscles will lose tone and our health will deteriorate. So we're looking for a planet about the size of Earth. Altogether, we have about 100,000 star systems that fit our parameters, so we start exploring and colonizing. And here's our first target. We've named this planet New Home. Hmm, clever. We fire up our faster-than-light engine, and bam, we're there! Even though this planet fits all our criteria, it's still hard to call this place home. Desert landscapes with lots of craters and canyons. We'll have to work hard to make this place look like Earth. The terraforming phase of the planet is about to begin. That means we're going to change the climate and the atmosphere here. That's it for today. So hey, if you pacified your curiosity, then give the video a like and share it with your friends. Or if you want more, just click on these videos and stay on the bright side.